Happy New Year! <laughs> what an amazing year 2023 was. What an incredible year of walking it was. And so I've cut together a little compilation of some of my highlights of the year, some of my favourite bits. I mean, obviously, there's not everything in there. There's a few bits that have been left out. Don't read, <laughs> don't read too much into that. And you'll also notice as the year goes on, there are uh, the, the, the sections, the month, there's fewer videos I've put into each month because the video was getting very long and I was editing that, well, I'm still working on it now, to be honest with you, but I was editing through till 6 a.m. And uh, yeah, and now I'm just literally sort of mixing it, finessing it and shooting this little intro for you. But before we get into that, I just want to say a massive thank you to you for, for all your support this year, for watching the videos and for coming on these amazing walks with me. And it's been, what an amazing year. Anyway, I'm waffling, I'm waffling. I hope you enjoy this little compilation and yeah and looking forward to an amazing year of walking in 2024. So what we're doing today well we're back down in South London which obviously doesn't instantly necessarily mean we're picking up our walk along River Quaggy but that is what we're doing. I just couldn't resist doing it. I've wanted to do it ever since the last one. I was going to do it the following walk. That's the beginning of November. And here it is. Here's the quaggy. And you can see just running naturally, free of any kind of culverting or concrete, meandering through the marshy meadow. What a glorious sight. It was worth coming out here today just to catch this view of the quaggy, the way it meanders naturally through this park after how we'd seen it running through Lewisham in a culvert being pushed underground, very much contained. This is a real thing of beauty. It is really exciting to capture these moments when these new developments are taking shape. I must admit, I can't think of many that have sprung out of the marsh mud in quite the same way as this that I've seen. I have to admit, I thought it was a lot more um, developed than this. I thought it was far nearer completion than it seems to be. I, I wouldn't like to speculate on uh, the percentage which is done, but I'm, I'm pretty sure I met someone in the red line in Leytonstone who lived out here like two or three years ago, so I thought it would have been pretty much finished by now. Swedenberg must have been, to some extent, a London wanderer. Yes. And I think he lays down a sort of snail trail that, for example, Arthur Macken lived mm. in Verulam buildings in Gray's Inn Road, very close to where we started. Yeah. And he, he has this story, N, where he is following a sort of magnetic current that carries you right up towards King's Cross, you branch off yeah. and you finish up going through edges of Dalston into Stoke Newington, yeah. where there is a, a paradise garden that you can see, but you can never enter it. Right. And this is a sort yeah. of Swedenborgian conceit. And I, I think, you know, in some senses, the journeys that previous people have made superimpose upon the ones that follow. Yeah. Yes, I mean, it's interesting in, when Swedenborg talks about the spiritual London, Holborn is at the center. And he talks about Islington to the south. Which is, Which is also yeah. totally Blakean. Yes. Because Blake makes these specific journeys within Jerusalem and other yes. times where he actually always names streets, cities, yes. districts, and it, and it becomes part of the spiritual journey of his cosmic energies. Yeah. And, the, and he argues with Swedenborg. That's right. But he wouldn't have known this stuff about Swedenborg. He wouldn't have known Swedenborg's only through anecdotal. Mm.
And there it is. An egret wading along the river shuttle. Some more great shuttle riverway signage. And now the river takes us through Willersley Park. Just a really beautiful sequence of parks and open spaces here, isn't it? This is Norwood Grove with its uh, grade two listed mansion there at the top of the hill, which apparently has views of the North Downs, which I think we've already spotted actually from previous vantage points, but that's still a mile of view. And here's the grade two listed mansion at the top of the hill here. Apparently not open to the public, so I don't know whether it's what like flats now or some sort of uh, care home perhaps. Can't really find anything about its past either, which is unusual. A house this size, you think it would have had an owner or an architect worthy of note, but not that I can find from a cursory glance. And here's the view out to the North Downs. It is stunning, absolutely stunning. And the final part of the walk takes us over Streatham Common glorious stretch of open common land, metropolitan common land preserved for the people. might leave this bit in of me coming back to get the camera because I, I don't think I did a walking shot in my last couple of videos and there you go partly because of this <laughs> coming back to get the camera and here's the, the crown jewels of Crouch End it's magnificent red brick clock tower this was originally the site though of a wooden cross that stood here in the middle ages there is the most likely origins of the name Crouch End, meaning uh, Crouch was an old word for a cross, and End being a kind of outlying district. And the name Crouch End has been recorded since, since the Middle Ages. It was uh, built to memorialise, I'll uh, put his name up, Henry Reader Williams. Is this, that's my memory of the notes I've just recently read. And he's responsible for kind of shaping the district and also for helping to preserve Queen's Wood in Highgate, so for that we can thank him. I also remember reading in the wonderful Hornsey Gazette when I lived up in this area in the early 90s that it was believed that two ley lines crossed here at the Broadway, two powerful ley lines, and that was why so many kind of hippies came to live here in the 70s, which gave this area its kind of artsy, kind of slightly natty feel, and why so many also musicians came here. So by the early 90s, it was sort of synonymous with Guardian journalists and uh, employees of the BBC. I'm not sure whether they came here because of the power of the ley lines, though. It's great to be back in Soho, picking up the traces of my walk that I filmed, I think it was in August, 
So we're going to walk around the other half of one of London's most famous, most storied and most attractive districts. I mean, I'm in Rupert Court right now, which is all right during the daytime. In the morning, there is a slight odour down here. I won't lie. Lovely to meet Mickey back there, a viewer who was out there doing a bit of photography, street photography. I imagine he was getting some decent shots by the looks of it. I love little streets like this. This is Bridal Lane and I think this is on the original 17th century street plan as well. It's certainly got that feel to it, hasn't it? The Duke of Argyle here on the corner of Beak Street and Great Windmill Street. That was a fine pub. And next on our walking tour of Soho is, uh, is Great Windmill Street. And Great Windmill Street is another street which uh, dates from that 17th century development of Soho. But unlike the rest of it, this was a bit more speculative and not so well, not so well done. This is looking up Earlham Street to Seven Dials. All the streets to the left here leading to Seven Dials, which is at the heart of the area that the um, Cock and Pie Ditch drained. The area within the ditch was known as um, simply as the marshland because that's what it was. And so the ditch encircled it, the Cock and Pie Ditch encircled it to drain that land. And of course, Thomas Neal developed the area around it once the land was drained and it also collected ditches from elsewhere and Scott in his comment mentioned the way that uh, Frith, I think it was Thomas Frith from Soho, possibly illegally diverted his sewer into the Cock and Pie, pie Ditch creating another you know what, what was once mythical lost river of Soho which was probably just Frith's um, drainage ditch, his sewer basically. So everything to the left was the marshy field uh, the Cock and Pie field and the name Cock and Pie Ditch comes from um, a pub that was here. I think originally it was called the Marshland Ditch. Tom posits a few names for different parts of it, but Cock and Pie is the one that it was last known as, apparently. So intriguing, eh? I was passed on this fantastic correspondence via email between a couple of old gentlemen of the area it was because it addressed issues of flooding in the area and it posited there were a number of streams that ran beneath the ground one of them was here in Windsor Road I bang on about Leytonstone's lost river Phillybrook often enough and I found the other branch of it up in Walthamstow as well that's been a subject of real interest to me for a number of years. And then also I've walked the Hyam Hill Brook in this area over in Walthamstow. But what's interesting in this, in this correspondence between these two old gentlemen, allotment holders, concerned with the flooding of the allotments, is that they said there were three other, originally back in history, three other streams that ran through the area. One, his current was running under here, Windsor Road down near the Leighton Orient ground, which is at the end of the street. And then there were two other streams in adjacent roads. The Essex earthquake of the 1800s forced two of those streams together into the Philly Brook. But a third one still ran down another adjacent road here. Never heard of them before, never heard of them, which is really interesting. I'm trying to see if I can see evidence of it here. So Leighton Orient's ground is just on the right of the frame here and the Phillybrook runs along the end there in Coronation Gardens. So you can see that this stream here, Minor Stream as it's called, in Windsor Road could have been diverted there into the Phillybrook. I don't know if you can hear the Orient there at home. Can you hear the singing?
I love this bit here. And there's that wonderful brick viaduct down there. It's my favourite point on this walk, I think. You can't beat a footpath that passes beneath such a grand viaduct. We can just about glimpse the river down there and its culvert. We can certainly get a better view of it if we look back here. But the next view may well be just up ahead from the, uh, from the A40 Western Avenue, which will be where the walk will end. Possibly one last view here of the river, another last view of the river before we pick it up again at the end of the walk on the A40. Interesting, I'm discovering parts of Wickham I've never been to before. I didn't know about this little park here where the river glides through the grassland. Isn't it delightful down there? As I mentioned before, chalk streams do create a very quite a unique habitat that really favours certain, I don't know what you would call them, but certain forms of life. I think mean, there's a certain form of crayfish which flourishes in chalk streams and there's certain plants as well. I believe trout are known to favour chalk streams. Here's the river here. My mate, Colin, I think his name was, when I was like five, he lived in that house there to the left. And we used to play in his garden and go, get into the river. Spent a lot of time in the river down here. I really want to avoid lapsing into mawkish sentimentality. It may be very difficult here. I'm a man in his early 50s, walking around the streets where I grew up. My auntie Carol lived behind me over there. She used to babysit me with my nan, just behind me over there. This is Norwich Guildhall. There's such a richness of medieval architecture here that you, in the end you even start to take it for granted a little bit. This is Lower Goat Lane. This is Potter Gate, and you can see look, so many lovely old buildings here. With the, the Belgian Monk pub down there, which I know is popular with uh, Norwich people. And this is St. John Madder Market, which is uh, one of the smallest medieval churches in Norwich. Uh, 
Burton Road, just on the eastern edge of the city, the opening of a great adventure. So we're in Curtain Road on the eastern edge of the city and today we've got an amazing, uh, we've got an amazing walk full of incredible stories, full of great essential London history and we also have Heidi joining us. The villages of Hoxton and Shoreditch are mentioned in the Doomsday Book. Shoreditch probably just literally meant Scores Ditch score being a person, the ditch just being the ditch that ran through their land. So they're ancient villages and they really started to develop at the end of the 16th century when wealthy people wanted to move out of the city into the countryside and so they started to build big houses in the fields just outside the city walls beside the Roman road. Another mazy little cliff top path here. Wow, this is a lovely bit of cool shade here with the sea just there through the trees. The path down through the woods was incredibly steep and it took me along a beautiful chalk path beneath the cliffs. As I continued to go further down towards the sea, I did start to wonder whether this was in fact the right way. And when I got down near the beach, a conversation with a dog walker confirmed my worst fears that there was no way ahead. The path just led out to the sea and I was gonna have to walk back up the incredibly steep path back up through the woods. Wow, what a beautiful sight that is. The end of the walk is just down there at the, the harbour, at Dover Harbour. So the Saxon Shore Way, that, what that runs from what that runs from the Thames Estuary out to the Kent coast, doesn't it, I think? Is that based on Hengist and Horster? I don't know. I think it might be. Hengist and Horster turning up at Pegwell Bay near Ramsgate. I think. Someone in the comments will definitely know. Well suddenly you're really starting to get a feel for the for the size, aren't you? For the for, for the for the expanse of these kind of environments. And, uh, and you know, if you'd have gone back, I don't know, sort of 500, 600 years, this would have all been mud. It would have all been infilled with kind of marsh, with a really narrow little channel kind of uh, incising it, its way through. And it's been all the industry, all the, all the mud digging for bricks and the, and the opening the channels up for the ports and, you know, and all that kind of thing. But over you know, hundreds of years, it, it opened up and there was a lot of worry sort of 30 years ago that this was a, a starved estuary that there wasn't enough mud and it was kind of like eroding um, but yeah you can see all the all the wetland is starting to come back what's the smell Kate? well it's that great muddy smell yeah and what's it, it contain within it? well you've got lots of microbes in here all kind of busy away on the on the organic matter and that produces all sorts of gases sort of like hydrogen sulfide gases and you've got methane being produced um, and that's that's kind of what you can smell. It's a good smell. It's not. It's people often think of it as being like a bad, rotten, dirty smell, but it's not. It's a it's a healthy, functioning ecosystem kind of smell.
there's something under my feet if I go down here? Uh, yes. The raft is not the best. Yeah. The raft is not. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Now I'm going to get in the raft, in the coracle. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't do that. I, I overcommitted to the throw myself in the. Paul, this, this is the most hospitality I've been offered. Well, actually, a sauna, a tea. There, do you drink whiskey? I, I have been known to drink whiskey. <laughs> it's happened. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a, it's only a tiny bottle of Lafroy. Oh. <laughs> this is like the greatest day of my life. <laughs> this is great. Look at this. This is incredible. All right. You're okay, ready I'm ready. Off? I'm ready to be cast off. This is, okay. this is it. Um, we offer um, John Rogers to you, the River Roding. I um, hope you both enjoy each other's company. Thank bon you. voyage. Thank you very much. Now cast afloat on the river roading. Oh, no. I jumped a bit too enthusiastically into the coracle head first and kind of smashed my head. I've got a bit of a headache, so I'm gonna I'm gonna partake of some of Paul's Lafroig. is you get drawn into the reeds and then it just spins you around. You can feel look, the only thing powering this boat is the river, is the current, the tide of the river roading. I know I always go on about it, but these little lanes and these alleyways really are the treasures of the city of London. Well, this is a fine ending to today's walk. Looking for the ghosts of old London, the ghosts of the old churches, walking through, perambulating the medieval street plan. And in fact, some of these lanes would date back to the Roman street plan of London. It's another enlightening and intriguing and invigorating walk. In the, I love the City of London walks. These trees are amazing. If you know what they are, I'd love to hear in the comments. Some sort of pine, aren't they? Look at this one. The trunk. It's amazing. And at the end of Grundy Street, we come upon the Landsbury Estate, the final location in our Ian Nairn tour. And it was built in 1951 as part of the Festival of Britain. It's an exhibition of living architecture, an example of how post-war Britain could be rebuilt. The Market Square here was the first pedestrianised shopping street in the whole of Britain, and it was a template that was copied throughout the land subsequently. 
It's wonderful to see it still here. It was designed by the brilliant Frederick Gibbard, who of course did Harlow Newtown and a number of other really important modern buildings. You can see here that the, uh, in the name of the pub here, the link to the Festival of Britain lives on. And look, I have the book. I finally have the book in my hands. It's real, it's here, available to buy from all good booksellers now. There'll be links below to places where you can buy and um, buy my new book. Welcome to New London, Journeys and Encounters in the Post-Olympic City. I'll talk more about that maybe later or in a separate video. But anyway, it's here, it's here. Oh my God, I can hear it. I can hear it from here. It's 20 yards away, I can hear it. Well, thank you, Joe. Here it is at the end of Haringey Park. It is loud because there was a lot of rain this week. So this is a perfect time to do this. I hope you can hear that. And what I think you can hear there is the sound of the Stonebridge Brook. Yes, that's what I believe this little river is called, the Stonebridge Brook. Look, I love that these railings here are bent, like someone's been desperate to actually get to the river. Beautiful deer just went skipping across the path here into the forest there, little munjack. Well, I don't know if it was a munjack, but it's a very small deer. I'm not sure if you can see the movement there. Just on the trees, on the corner, on the edge of the thicket. Wow. I hope you enjoyed that revisiting of our fantastic walks of 2023 and here's looking forward to more amazing walks in 2024 and as I always like to say I look forward to seeing you on the next walk wherever that may be. I've already planned the next one and it's a bit special. Mm -hmm.